Cool. We'll give it just a couple of moments um, for folks to come into the room. Hello, everyone. Um, get settled. We'll begin in just a few moments. Um, I'm just going to start our live broadcast on Facebook, and I'll then introduce our moderator and our panelists. Um, so get cozy, get comfortable, and we'll be um, with everyone in just a few moments. Thank you all for your patience while I set up the live stream to our Facebook page. That way more folks can tune into the conversation as well. Welcome everyone to Hidden Histories of Windsor Essex, a community conversation. We host these conversations once a month to see what are folks in our community talking about? What are important topics that should be talked about? So when you think about the history of Windsor and Essex, what comes to mind? You might think of Hiram Walker, Ford, or Chrysler, or even the Rum Runners, the trademark histories that stand out when we talk about Windsor. But many histories that construct the fabric of our region have been actively excluded when it comes to swapping stories of Windsor's past. Where can we learn more about the stories that are critical to the makeup of Windsor Essex? What are some of the hidden histories that have shaped the people and the region we call home? And how can we work together to ensure these histories receive the awareness they deserve? This conversation will focus on the region's important stories that were never taught in our history classes. We encourage engagement and respectful, curious questions about the topic of this conversation. Um, so with that said, just an agenda so you know what to expect for tonight's evening. Uh, we'll begin with our land acknowledgement followed by our pillar of creating conversations. We'll go to our Zoom poll, our first Zoom poll to see um, what folks here in this room are thinking. Um, we'll then, introduce our moderator and our panelists. We'll have time for discussions and questions, and then we'll end our evening with our second Zoom poll to see if your opinions might have been changed um, and to see where you stand um, at the end of our conversation. So with that said, I'll start with our land acknowledgement. The Art Gallery of Windsor respectively acknowledges that we are located on Anishinaabe territory, the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations, comprised of the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. And today, the Anishinaabe of the Three Fires Confederacy are represented by Walpole Island First Nation. We want to state our respect for the historical and ongoing authority of Walpole Island First Nation over its territory. And wherever you may be tuning in from tonight, we encourage you to do the same. Whose land are you on? At the Art Gallery of Windsor, we love creating conversations. We want to spark community conversations around ideas and issues such as history, culture, and society, and using the gallery's collections and exhibitions as entry points. And again, this conversation will focus on the region's important stories that we are never taught in our history classes. And we encourage engagement and respectful, curious questions about the topic of this 
conversation. So again, feel free to engage in the chat or if you have questions for the panelists, uh, please drop them in the Q&A box. That's, that way it's uh, easier to keep track of and we can go back and find them. Um, so before we jump into our conversation, I'm going to launch our first Zoom poll and you should see it pop up on your screen. I'm just gonna move it out of the way here. Um, but before we start our conversation, our discussion, we have some questions for you, you the audience at home. Uh, the first question is, I have a strong grasp of the history of Windsor Essex. Yes, somewhat or no. Question number two, I know regional history from different cultures such as black history, indigenous history, and or queer history. Yes, somewhat or no. And it's really fascinating as the results come in, you can see them change. Um, number three, I care about the lesser known histories of Windsor, Essex, yes or no. Uh, so I'll just give it a few more seconds um, for everyone to submit their answers and then we will launch the poll again at the end to see how they are the same or if they're different. So I'll just give it a few more seconds because I still see some votes coming in, um, people casting um, their votes. All right, so I will end the poll and I'm going to share the results so you can see on your screen uh, what people thought of these questions. So 19% uh, said yes, 58% said somewhat, 23% said no. So maybe we are going to learn a little bit more about our histories here in Windsor Essex. So you can see where everyone um, kind of stands, but one thing for sure, 100% of people said that they care about the histories and we're here to learn more. So you're in the right spot. <laughs> Excellent. So I'll just move this out of the way and introduce our moderator for tonight's uh, discussion, Craig Pearson, who's back yet again for another conversation. So Craig Pearson is the managing editor of the Windsor Star and a longtime daily journalist and educator. He has worked as a journalist for 35 years and for the last 31 years at the Windsor Star. The Montreal native has covered art and entertainment in City Hall and everything in between, served as a war correspondent in Afghanistan and has won numerous awards, including the co-winner of the National Newspaper Awards Citation of Merit, who that was a mouthful, for the Windsor Stars 2014 gun running series. He has taught journalism part-time at the University of Windsor for 22 years and is the author of two from the vault history books based on Windsor Star photos. He has hosted many community events and has moderated various panel discussions. Craig, it's always a pleasure to see you. I'll pass it over to you and I will fade into the background and I'll be back uh, towards the end of the conversation. But over to you, Craig. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sophie. I could not have... Uh, written that intro for me any better than you did. <laughs> anyway, um, this is, of course, the fourth community conversation that the Art Gallery of Windsor has hosted. And I love the idea because it allows the gallery to go beyond the walls of the building and talk about issues of the day, which as a newspaper editor, I happen to love. So I'm pleased to be moderating this event. The question is, I guess, what is in a history book? Sometimes not enough. I think we'll see that uh, often there are worthwhile stories that do not get told, at least not in any official capacity. So we're here to discuss that, to discuss why, and possibly talk about a, a few good stories that we should be learning about a little bit more. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, Walter Cassidy has been, yes, has been a high school teacher for the last 20 years. He is the uh, teacher sponsor of the first GSA in our area since 2009. 
He is the founder and chair of the GSA for staff. He's the chair of the Windsor Essex Rainbow Alliance, which is working to preserve the 2S LGBTQAI history in this area, as well as working with the city on a pride plaza that would give the community a permanent meeting place with historical connections. I believe that might be in Lansbury Park, but anyway, he can tell us about that. He's recently been published on various local uh, 2S LGBTQAI historical moments, including a local timeline going back to 1842. He's currently working on a book and creating lesson plans to help local schools to be more inclusive with local 2S LGBTQAI historical events. D.A. Lockhart, otherwise known as Daniel, is the uh, author of multiple collections of poetry and short fiction. His most recent work includes Bear Men Descend Upon Gimli, which is Frontenac, Frontenac House, 2021 publisher, Go Down Odawa Way, Kegedonse Press, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and Breaking Right Stories. Porcupine's Quill 2021. His work has appeared widely throughout Turtle Island, including Best Canadian Poetry 2019, The Malahat Review, Grain, CV2, Troy Quarterly, The Fiddlehead, ARC Poetry Magazine, and Belt. Along the way, his work has garnered numerous Pushcart Prize nominations, National Magazine Award nominations, and Best of the Net nominations. He's a graduate of the Indiana University Bloomington MFA in Creative Writing Program, where he held a Neil Marshall Graduate Fellowship in Fiction. I will not be able to pronounce this properly, so Daniel will be able to tell us that in a bit, but he is, I'm going to say, part of the Moravian of the Thames First Nation. Lockhart currently resides at Wawayatenang, and Peely Island, where he is the publisher of Urban Farmhouse Press and poetry editor at the Windsor Review. And finally, we have <clears throat> Dennis K. Smith, whose distinctive style of painting results in works that evoke a response. His use of descriptive and rhythmic brushwork and vivid choreographed passages of color makes his work come alive. Smith places importance on well-staged compositions and strong design. For over 60 years, Smith has been visually vocalizing his story through his art. If his artistic endeavors could be characterized in vocal styling terminology, he would consider himself a crooner, an ironic term denoting an emphatically sentimentally and his, sorry, in his depictions of his subjects. His work conveys honesty, simplicity, and a sense of calmness that causes one to stop and take time to connect with the painting and its message. He is exhibited in many juried group and solo shows and exhibitions. Dennis has conducted workshops as well as open classes at his LaSalle studio. He is the president and co-founder of the Artists of Color. Thank you all for joining us. You panelists clearly have some uh, strong, um, qualifications to join us here. Uh -huh. And without any further ado, I'd like to uh, get to the uh, questions. And the first one, given that this is all about hidden histories, is, um, is there a hidden history that you could share with us tonight? And we'll start in the order I am uh, seeing people on the screen, and that is Walter Cassidy. Thank you so much. It's interesting. That's kind of a loaded question because, in reality, most queer and trans local history is hidden, and uh, there has been a, a, a very little work done on it. There has been one book that was published by by Windsor Pride in 2010, and that was people who basically taught about or spoke about their experiences. But to my knowledge, beyond just um, the book that. Uh, that was written about the serial killer in 45, but that really wasn't about queer culture. It just happened to be an element of that. Um, there really hasn't been uh, much about that. And if there has, so the first one I talk about, uh, 1842, that's been around for a long time, but most of the, uh, when you, most of the time when you look at that information, most people think it actually happened in Kingston. 
because the, the two men who were soldiers at Fort Malden were caught having some fun and were arrested and put on trial at Sandwich and were given the death penalty. And uh, what ended up happening is the governor general got involved, their, their um, um, sentence got commuted and they were sent to Kingston Penn. But, so most of the history just talks about Kingston Penn. So everyone thinks that that's where it happened. But the, the big thing for me is there's so much that still is hidden and hidden for me that I'm desperately wanting to find out because I've had people who've told me that when they were active in the 70s, they would talk to queer people who were around in the 20s and 30s, and they've said there was an active um, uh, community in the 20s in Windsor, and I have found no documentation to prove that. And so that's, I know it existed because it existed in Montreal, it ex existed in Detroit, so I believe it existed here, but finding that information is the most difficult part. Uh, and that's kind of part of the, the journey I'm going through. Each day, I find little bits all over the place and trying to put it all together. Thanks for that. I, I read a, a piece in the Star that Ann Jarvis wrote about you in, in, in December, and it was just loaded with hidden histories that you've uncovered, which is fabulous. And I think that we should mention that the uh, two soldiers you mentioned from 1842, um, they were sentenced to hang. Their sentence was commuted, but it's not like they got off scot-free. They still spent, I think, seven and 11 years in prison, respectively. Yes. Just, just for yeah. enjoying Absolutely. each other's company. Anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, next, we could uh, move to uh, Dennis Smith, uh, who could yeah. talk to us if you have any sort of hidden histories you'd like to share with us. Well, this is probably history I heard, I learned maybe 20 years ago, but... Um, I hadn't heard much um, involvement in the 1812, uh, 1812 war and, or any of the really wars concerning black soldiers. And this was the capture of the schooner in. And this was a, uh, a battle that took place in Amherstburg in this area. And like I said, I hadn't never heard of it uh, till then. So I know it's being to talked now or been told now or into the schools or teach, I'm sorry. Um, but I basically I have done a painting of this battle because I couldn't I went online trying to find any record of it as far as visual and I couldn't find one that really told the true the whole story. So the schooner Ann was basically um, the incident that happened in 1838 and um, it was a um, attempt of the attempt of the Patriots to basically capture Fort Malden or you know they just wreaked havoc on Amherstburg. And uh, they captured a ship loaded with three cannons and uh, ammunition. And they they basically hid behind Bobble Island and come out firing the cannons upon Amherstburg. Um, at that time, the fort wasn't really protected, have enough protection. But um, so they just rode up the river, shooting this cannon into the town. Uh, a call went out to for help and um, it, it was the the black militia basically in Amherstburg, Chatham, um, Harrow, and these were farmers who basically volunteered because they didn't want uh, the Americans really to come back and take them back to, into slavery. So they, they grabbed their weapons. Uh, one farmer actually left his field with his pitchfork um, to come to protect the fort. Um, the second night, the same thing, the, the, queen, the schooner Ann came out firing upon uh, Amherstburg and um, these, uh, the militia here, they ran alongside on shore firing at the, uh, the ship. And um, it was a uh, January, Jan it was actually January the 9th, so it was a winter evening, um, but the moon was full and was out. So. Basic, everyone on the ship was basically lit up by the moon. And um, the, um, the, the, uh, so the militia basically, they're, they're firing on the ship, made everybody vulnerable. So uh, they basically hit the, um, I, there was one death and it was the, uh, uh, the person that was steering the boat. But basically the boat ended up losing control and ran 
uh, ground, but it was stuck, stuck there and tilted to the side. So basically, uh, these ma militia men, they uh, basically waded out into the ice cold water uh, to take the ship. And that battle, I said, it's, they have a plaque there now, but I said, when I was young, I never heard of such battles. And there was a number of battles in Queenston Heights, um, Detroit, Windsor, you know, there was a battle there where these militia were involved. So this is part of the, my black history that I didn't know about until later on in my years. Now these events are being taught, but it's still very um, sparse. And um, so I think this was a, an important time to bring out these hidden histories. Yeah, I, I think it's fabulous. I just a quick question. This this is not I, I love the idea that you paint the history that you see yeah. either your personal history. Is this ship part of that history you were talking yeah, that about? That is the painting of a schooner and capture. Wow. Yeah, that's fabulous. That's what cool. a great idea. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, also moving on now to Daniel Lockhart. Hey, uh, wow. What an honor to hear a couple of these uh, stories so far. And uh, and a real honor to, to be sharing some space with y'all. Um, I know there's a couple of weird words in there and it took me a lot of years to learn them too. So we're not, we're gonna, we're gonna forget the P word because that's a, that actually just means turtle clan. I'm specifically turtle clan of the Moravian of the Thames First Nation. And the other word is what I want to actually talk about, which is Wawayongatanam, which is the traditional name for this region. And when I say region, it's really important to say region uh, because the borders are a colonial construct. And when it comes to history, I really want us to start thinking about history in a post-colonial sense. Oddly enough, this was taught to me at Trent University uh, up in lovely Peterborough, Ontario, by the great John Laudlin of the Canadian Studies Department, where he said everything depends on the land. And this is where even the term Wawiyongatanam becomes important here. What it means is that Windsor and Detroit are the same community. We are the same region. We just happen to have a border thrown down the middle. And there's something inherent in us that's cosmopolitan. Because if we go back to the first peoples that were here, uh, it was a mixture of three nations, the Odawa, the Potawatomi, and the Ojibwe. What I want to talk about is how they came here. So it was the fires of the, so let me slow down here. I'm getting all fired up about this, right? <laughs> so there's this belief system that exists, and it, it does move into Lenape as well. We, uh, our word for Ojibwe, <clears throat> people are the people who went away. So the Medewin win is a, is a medicine society. It's a, a religious society that, that sort of mapped out our history and our future at the same time. So Windsor, Wawayongatanong, is actually site of the second fire of the Medewin win. Right now we are living in the, the in the, and that was the second fire, we're living in the seventh fire, which is a sort of rekindling of our cultures you're starting to see all across Turtle Island. But here was where um, they had the vision that uh, sort of set them on their way to rejoining spirituality. So the person, basically what happens is that those three nations, they travel up to St. Lawrence after receiving visions of sort of bad things coming. So we knew that there was gonna be white folks coming across her. I hate that term. I, I mean, just people across the water, okay? We, we don't wanna go down those racist terms. In case you can't see, I'm a little pale on myself. So <laughs> anyways, people moved inland and we they knew they were coming. And this was the second stop, the second major fire on the on the, on their way. And this is what creates the Three Fires Confederacy. So the people of the land that came here separate, they actually came here as Ojibwe and they lost their way. And that's the traditional teachings. So they wandered far to the West, which is like Michigan. And they wandered to the South, which was probably Indiana or the Great Black Swamp. And they came back. And when they came back, a little girl on the pot, from the Potawatomi people, so likely on the North Shore, close enough though, the both nations were moving back and forth constantly, had a vision of where they were to go. And that was Manitoulin Island, the great spirit island. And this is what brought the nation back together. The, the, Nish, the Anishinaabe belief system comes back together after this. So Winter, in the history of, uh, of indigenous life in North America, Wawa Yangtang is really important. And even that term speaks to our nature today. It's where the river flows opposite the way it should, yet still does and provides great for life. It's, it's a really, <laughs> term that that becomes but it really expresses that hustle that sort of strength the the, the worker the, the willing to work against the grain that is both communities of Windsor and Detroit I just hearing you talk about that 
so easily. I have the impression that you've written about this sometimes. <laughs> I've read a couple books. Now, it's been in my brain for a while because I, I studied under uh, David McNabb from, uh, from Walpole when I was at Trent. I learned a lot from my elders while I was up there. But yeah, I've been working through a lot. And I'm currently working on a, a book for Bibliotheus. That's the history of the Detroit River, uh, but the river itself. So an indigenous history of that. Beautiful. Thanks. Thanks very much. All three of you. Those are fabulous stories to start the evening. I uh, really appreciated hearing them. And uh, my, my first question then would be, uh, what tends to get recorded in history? What tends to not be recorded? And why do you think that's the case? And I suppose we just keep going with the same order, if that's OK with you, Walter. Sure. No problem. Um, I'm going to be a little facetious and say the word pervert. And I, why I say that is because it, when looking in queer and trans history, you have to look at derogatory words. You have to look at people getting arrested. You have to look at uh, people being, um, uh, their whole lives being destroyed. And unfortunately, that's what's recorded uh, is when people were um, um, being targeted by the police and the courts and so forth. So when I did, when I look at my history, I have to look at uh, unnatural, pervert, disgusting, gross indecency. And of course, those are the getting into the legal terms. And then what would always happen to these poor individuals is their home address would be put in the Windsor Star. Mm -hmm. So then what ended up would happen is they would move and they would have to go somewhere else. So then you have to try to find where they went because sometimes they would start a new life and do interesting things or they just disappear from history, including their death. Because if they had no loved ones or they were rejected by their loved ones, there's no record of what happened to them. And when we talk about Windsor and Detroit, that's so true when it comes to the history of the queer and trans com community. There was this thing called the, the gay commute where many people in Windsor would go to Detroit to live their lives uh, freely and openly and then come back to Windsor and everything would be shut and vice versa. And that's why we actually have had um, a long history of, of bars, not many, but um, that existed. And even when I was able to find um, the, uh, the first bathhouse raid in Canada, I was able to find it because of looking for those terms, but the paper had even said it itself that it was the first one that all, that all men were being arrested and no one had looked at this. And, and I know that simply because the top scholar, it, uh, Tom Hopper said, I've never seen this. And that's part of that issue was trying to find that information uh, based on the, that language, but that was so obvious. And most of the people who were arrested were from the States. And the one, uh, there were a couple of uh, people from Windsor and they moved away. So, so that's what's being told. What's not being told is those love letters. Those, those are the really rare things that you find. Saskatchewan, actually, they were lucky to find a collection. Uh, the actual um, true stories of, of people falling in love, having wonderful relationships, all that kind of stuff, because what ends up happening too is family members destroy them. I, I have had talked to so many people family members of, of people from the 1980s and 90s. And after they died, they just went, they just threw it out. They didn't see the value in what they were uh, uh, collecting. And so there, there's so much stuff that disappears because of that lack of value in ourselves as queer trans people, but also as a, a, a community, thinking that their history is important and should be archived and kept. Uh, and that's one of the things I'm working on and trying to do that because currently, example, there's in the museums in Windsor, the only thing that's been officially archived is a button. There's nothing else. And the University of Windsor is, is now starting to collect with the work that I've done with Wear Of. So we're starting, it's happening, but unfortunately, a lot of it has already gone forever. Yeah, I, some of the things you said really resonated. One, that um, people's uh, addresses were put in the paper. That, that's terrible. I mean, it's the paper I work for now. Uh, but I, I know that some of the work you've done includes, you know, you have posters from different gay dances and whatnot that 
how you found those, I don't know, but thank goodness you did. Otherwise, you're right, they would have been gone for forever. But anyway, thanks for that. Um, Dennis, what, what types of things do you see uh, being recorded in history and whatnot, and why do you think that is? I think the things that are recorded is those things that are, are promoted to sway um, the objective of the day um, and of the times. Um, the thought, I mean, we can go back to slavery where a lot, because of the slaves worked in the fields and they invented or created tools that, you know, would aid in the work or invented things. But anything that was invented was the property of the owner. And so they get all the credit. The slaves didn't get anything. So like I said, and that continues down, you know, where a lot of the credit or things were basically whitewashed, I'll put it that way, very simple. And events a lot of times are covered up in that way uh, because they were looked at as, okay, well, we're not going to report that because um, this is a, a black man here that, you know, the worth is not there. Um, so a lot of things back then were covered up and now presently, but today, even today, we look at outside of, you know, just having a black history, but events themselves are being controlled by basically the times. Um, we'll, we'll look, we'll, I mean, 20 years from now, we'll look at what's going on or what happened in Windsor. Um, how is it going to be recorded and reported? Will it be reported as just a local event or a, a, a provincial it, you know, story? Or will it be a, a worldwide story? And how will they look at it? Will it be demonized or will it be, um, you know, held up as something that was great? But it's, today we have one view of Tomorrow will be a different view. So it's how that history is being recorded at the time and who was there. Um, but like I said, a lot of um, the history of the black uh, inventors and all that were basically not given that credit because, again, they weren't allowed to have it. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. And I. It's well said, given that uh, sometimes it's the person telling the story who gets to decide what the history is going to be. Um, Daniel, what do you think tends to get recorded in history books? So this is going to be this is a little heavy one for me. I will admit I grew up in Windsor, uh, went to Catholic Central uh, and yeah, lots of fun memories still. But the one thing that was always strange growing up is the two different stories I was being told. And one of the ones locally was that uh, that the first peoples here were the Huron, which isn't true. And uh, that everyone just peacefully left, which is also not true because there's a huge, huge indigenous population in Wawiyong and Tanong, or both Windsor and Detroit. So one of those things is definitely how that was, why that was being said. Now, as I did more research, looking at some of the Wayne State archives, I was fortunate enough to be a librarian in Michigan for a while. So I got access to a lot of more stuff that you would get nowadays because we're trapped most of the time over here. But what I found was there was a definite decided move, it seems in scholarship around the 1920s, maybe to the 50s, that we stopped talking about the other people that lived here and only focus on the Hurons or the, the Christianized Indians that they imported. Um, and when I say they imported, it was imported by the Catholic Church. So those sort of things, they're, they're, they're left out. Like my people, we settled up at uh, Moravian Town because the Christian uh, natives wouldn't let us they said, no, don't let those Protestant natives here. So there's a lot of things that are left out and they're still there. We have to go digging. And it's, I, I often think about how I grew up uh, in South Walkerville and how my, my parents, my dad and my brother both went to Kennedy and I knew nothing of Emancipation Day and that, the, the, the burning of the grandstand. And nowadays it's still pulling teeth to try to get that recognized, to get that repaired and, 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 to, to make that part of the community great. So it's left out for political reasons. There's no doubt that this is about power. Who controls the stories, who controls us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's right. Uh, side note, I happen to be sitting in South Walkerville right now. <laughs> <laughs> Represent. Anyway, <laughs> um, so what types of things would you like to see receive more media and historical attention? Uh, again, with Walter. Um, I think that 
Well, one of the things I always say is that in my community, we are in all, in all privileged groups and all oppressed groups. And I think one of the things that I'm not seeing is, so example with Black History Month, um, Black trans and, and queer individuals also have to be celebrated. Ind indigenous, two-spirited, indigi-queer, LGBTQ um, have to be a part of that. And I think that intersectionality is very important. I think that's the key because then it just becomes a gay man story all the time. And, I, and those other stories have to be part of that. And it, that's a harder, especially as a, a white man, that's a harder conversation because uh, trying to help get those stories out, it can be really difficult. To, and and um, uh, a trust factor is a big, big, uh, big deal to get people because there's a lot of pain. I've interviewed a lot of people who have broken down and cried because mm -hmm. of the hate, because of the prejudice. If it wasn't from the outside, it was also within from their own communities, uh, racialized or their own families or or just Windsor itself. I've talked to people who left in the 50s, have, have had wonderful lives in San Francisco and so on. And I've seen more and more people leaving because they just could not survive in this area. And for me, it's very important to change that. So I, to me, that's a key. And one of that key is to have those stories visible and have those stories heard. So then they go, wow, I'm part of that story. And even those horrific stories, um, when they're told, they're at least acknowledging that history because uh, at times I've talked to teachers who didn't even know that being gay was illegal at one point. They just, no one thinks of it anymore. They think it's always been that possibility. And, and as well as with just human rights issues, they were amazing people in this area that fought for our rights that are not being recognized. One of them is John Damien, who is a national hero, who almost everyone has forgotten about him. And he did a huge fight and he was from Windsor. He died in Windsor and he fought just for basic rights. So those type of things have to get out there. Just when you're talking about John Damien, maybe uh, in case some... Uh, participants don't know he I believe was fired for being gay and he fought it yeah he, he got fired in 1975 he moved to Toronto uh, he was involved in horse racing and he, at that point he was a steward who evaluated the races and he was one one of three only people in Ontario that had that position and he fought it for 12 years and unfortunately he died of cancer but he died uh, two months after it finally happened uh, where same sex uh, sorry uh, sexual orientation was included in the Human Rights Code in Ontario in 86. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Dennis, what would you like to see more media and historic coverage? Well, of course, it's all directed at their youth. Um, more study probably locally in your history books of uh, your neighbors, the people within your community, and how they contribute to a history. Um, because for Windsor has such a rich history for, you know, black history um, there that really should be, there's more and there's continually to be more um, that we need to learn and teach our youth. Um, I'll refer to like, have, if I had a pencil upon my uh, desk and I see it, I just reach over and, and take it. But if the pencil was in another room where I couldn't see it, and didn't know where it was, I would go and I run into roadblocks and maybe I'll just give up trying to find it. But we have a rich history here and if they can, and because of our, we're right next door to the United States, we get all of their history. I mean, when I was young, basically all the history I, I got was probably American history. And now we're getting our Canadian history. But like I said, we have people that we can tell our young engineers, yeah, we had a uh, inventor. Elijah McCoy, who grew up in Colchester, who changed the whole um, uh, efficiency of their railroads. Um, we can tell our young people that are going to be songwriters that we had a writer named Shelton Brooks, who was born in Amherstburg, who became world known for his music, his uh, writing, his acting. Um, but these are people right within our community that we can see. I mean, there's been a lot of people who have become champions winning a race 
And that little bit of energy that they got to make it to the finish line was because they looked over and seen uh, their heroes or their supporters there pushing them forward. So we have our own heroes right here in our, our area that we don't really put in front of our young people. So I think our history needs to be touchable that they can relate to and they can see a, a finish line right there that someone has done for them. Excellent. You'd like to see obviously more local history. Right, right. Making it, yeah, be, being recognized. Right. Thanks so much. Um, Daniel, um, <clears throat> excuse that, me, how about yourself? Uh, Dennis, excellent points. Uh, I definitely want to add to this in one way. And this came across my feed today on social uh -huh. media, which is usually evil, but today it was okay. Uh, but it was on the, it's, there's an account that tweets out the history of Windsor wrestling. And on the Twitter account, they were tweeting out, uh, and I shared it, uh, mm -hmm. famous, well, Windsor indigenous wrestlers. And mm -hmm. doing it for a while, that's the kind of history. That's the way the living, breathing history, it can connect yeah. to people. Uh, it, ways like we could talk about sort of even who was performing at the top hat and for those who don't know the top hat was uh, mm -hmm. up downtown yeah, right. uh, and brought in world famous musicians there are people there are Windsorites that were influenced by that 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 sort of carried that forward that maybe they they went on to play at places like fog lounge or maybe back in the day it was eclectic or you went down to play at other things around the city those are that's really interesting history now uh, what I would like is I would like before we put up monuments to things that we really consider how much they embody our history. And I'm going to point out one very major flaw the city has done, and that's the Tecumseh statue. Tecumseh never lived in the city. Um, he was actually murdered by uh, in the War of 1812 by a man uh, by the name of Meg. Uh, the guy was the guy who dealt the death blow, and he was friends with that man who lived right across the Detroit River. So the 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 way that that's handled is kind of despicable in my opinion because they also put it as a white handler he's got a little guy holding the pony so he can't get away yet windsor has an amazing indigenous history because like i said we never left little known fact and why i am amazed the city has not done anything about this solomon white was the first mayor of the city of windsor that pushed for this place to become a city and he was the son of joseph white the chief of andern and first nation he was born on that, that First Nation. He met so much of this community. Yeah, he was, a, I mean, he belonged to a very specific party, and I'm sure there's some things that people didn't agree with. Yet, as an Indigenous man, to have done this, this is 1890. So obviously, they had been enfranchised at this point in time. He was able to vote and sort of become the mayor of the city. Um, but, I mean, dang, that is history that should be in a statue and not some imported sort of political history glorifying war and the death of a man who didn't want to die for this country or the United States mm -hmm. on First Nation land. So that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the stuff that I want to dealt with, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Hey, on that note, I, you know, not for this conversation, but I'd love to speak to you about Solomon White after possible story or something, something like that. That sounds like a, a fascinating history that has yet to really been recently publicized anyway. What's the best part about exploring history, and in particular, history that so many people don't know about? Starting again, as always, with Walter. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that I love is when I'm talking to the people who I'm asking their history, they're amazed that I care, that anyone cared. Um, and when I and when I tell them that this is so important, and then as a teacher, that my goal is to get these stories in schools, that just shocks them, right? They just don't see why 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 do anyone cares? And and when I talk to students, and I've talked to students about John Damien and so on, a lot of them they they have no idea um and they start getting angry themselves why don't we know this why haven't we taught this like this is important and i think that's that's becomes the the issue is is the concept of what's important and who has who controls the keys to whatever is is considered important and so for me it's just to see that excitement and then that pushes me to want to do more because they just you see them wanting it and and getting angry then they want more so then I get angry and I said I want to know more and it just keeps on going um and and then it's just 
that element of just like yeah they they see worth in themselves there's a big thing in in edu speak that we do uh which is that students should see themselves in the curriculum and that's the key is is they do they need to and when they do you just see that difference they feel part of something and they do and i agree most history queer history is about the united states as well stonewall all that kind of stuff and when they hear that Windsor did, there are people in Windsor that did stuff like, and we have major people in relation to like same-sex marriage, uh, fighting that. There's so many examples. So um, they they just see, wow, this is a place which I always call Windsor a diamond in the rough, which, you know, you have to find it. And once you find it, you realize that you have this gem that you have to just work work on yourself to make it look beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, one thing I took from what you just said is that, uh, you, you know, you, you like looking for the stuff that people haven't found. It tends to make you angry, but it's 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 the impetus for you to look even further. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, what do you like about uh, researching history and finding things that haven't been told as much as they should well, be? Well, I think it's important to learn and to promote pride. And one thing it should force us or basic drive us to improve um, from what we know. And also by doing that, we're going to make a new piece of history. Um, so it's a, a step to go keep going forward. And it's also a step to remind us where we came from. And, you know, so I think it's important that well, that's, that's what I feel. And also one thing I get the impression you like uh, about uh, looking into history is painting it yeah relaying it in a visual way yeah for me like i said uh, uh, vid- i mean when i look that is what i i can take something in by seeing an image of it and it's been like that ever since i was young i mean yeah. i did most of my creating my looking i mean one lesson was the uh, uh the saturday post I think it was in our composition classes in public school. You know, they would bring the old Post magazine and the cover of it was always a painting of Norman Rockwell. And we were to look at the painting or the cover and then write a story around that or create a story. And that was one of my best, the classes I love go to because I love creating from an image and just imagine what was going on in that uh, picture. So for history, like I said, history, I learn a lot from the spoken history, when, when a historian tells me, then the vis- I visually see it and basically I become part of that. And you know, and that's the thing with history, we can't make history if we're not part of it. Um, I remember when uh, Nelson Mandela came to Detroit once he was freed and I went over the, to Detroit, the Tiger Stadium because I wanted to be there. And when I came back, you know, a couple people said, why don't you go through all that when you could just watch it on TV? And I said, no, I didn't want to watch it. I want to be part of that history. So, you know, in order to make history, you got to be part of it. So, um, you know, that's why I think it's important to remember because we'll learn from it and hopefully create our own histories. Great. Thanks a lot. Daniel, what, what's the best part about un- uncovering history that you haven't heard much about before? Well, for me, uh, I'm someone who's lived in a couple of places. Uh, I mean, I came back to Windsor, but I lived in Michigan, Montana, Indiana, and, and Peterborough. Um, to an extent, Peterborough was definitely something very different as well. But what history does is it connects it connects me in a way to the place that I could never have been connected to. So maybe I didn't in high school, there were maybe, for example, in Indiana, history is a passion amongst many Hoosiers. And I lived in a, we lived in a historic neighborhood, kind of like Walkerville, um but poor significantly poor and there is this uh this underlying notion that history was here because you are if you live in indiana you're a hoosier and that you're walking the path of many other hoosiers from james whitcomb riley to david letterman like these are these are stories that are flying around and like history is living and breathing so when i want to read history i actually become like more transfixed on the way the city actually is so for example, I now live in Paulette Village. And often if I'm standing on Wyandotte and Paulette, there's this sort of vision that comes in of the streetcar, the old streetcars, the old theaters that used to be in this, this area. Mm-hmm. 
know that. Even if you move, say, down towards uh, uh, Karen, down in near downtown Windsor, that was the heart of the Odawa village that was on the shore. So you can feel that. And if you, it, it, you can just sort of even ha inhabit that space, you your senses can, to, can pick it up. And I think that's, there's almost a spiritual aspect of history for me, I guess. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. I, um, we're starting to actually run out of time. So I want to, we have actually a few uh, questions coming in from the audience. So I wouldn't mind asking a couple of these. Um, th this first one here is a bit of a bit of a longer one, but I, I think, uh, Daniel, you might be able to answer this one. Um, the history of Assumption Church continues to main, main, sorry, to maintain the myth that it was the Jesuit who invited the Wyandotte of the Huron to settle here in empty land. The addition of the plaque out front of the Bobby House Museum describes the slave owners of the house are a recent addition. Why are our political leaders continuing to only reluctantly give passing acknowledgement of some historical truths that more likely perpetuate the myth? often enough using our tax dollars, like the Tecumseh statue. Who would like to jump in on that one? <laughs> yeah, it's not loaded, is it? <laughs> well, there's there's existing power structures. And I think that the, uh, challenging those, well, uh, I don't know, man, like fighting with the Catholic church is a difficult beast. I went to Catholic school, my grandmother, uh, who I barely knew was a survivor, uh, survivor of residential school. There's a lot of stuff that's, um, if you dig too deep, people get in too much trouble. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of the land around here was not properly surrendered. Uh, they did import Hurons that were good uh, Christian natives. I mean, that, that is true. But to, to justify the morals and the average everyday person, we're willing to tell a lot of white lies in society. White lies? No, they're probably more words than that. Just straight up lies. <laughs> yeah. ah, that's a loaded question. Anyone else? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Anybody else wanted to jump in on that one, or I, th I think that's part. We have to reevaluate all monuments. It, it seems it has to be. You have to renew them. There's so many examples. History is not simply, you know, that you know, stamp it. It's done. It's it's always renewed so these all of these plaques and so on there should be a system set up to renew the, renew them and be more uh, uh, current just simple as that but uh that's economics right there's no system of it's it's because a lot of times communities are the ones who fight for these and of course um and they themselves were based on the history they knew at the time and and they themselves then um, you know, there are plaques that many people don't even know exist there, and they're they're 50 years old and completely inaccurate, but no one's seen them. Mm -hmm. And then and then if you have an issue with it, it's all about money. And if you have an issue, who's going to pay for it, which always comes back. And once again, it's the community who has to has to be be the one that has to go forward. I think I think that brings up a question, too, is like, what do you do? I, you're right. Like, uh, history is evolving and our perceptions are evolving. So we have um, sculpture and, and monuments that we've done in the past. Do we get rid of that? Do you get rid of art or do you add to it? I'm not, you know, what's the question and, and who pays for it? Uh, sorry, what's the answer and who pays for it is difficult, but you bring up a, a great point. Anybody else wanted to get in on that one or? No, uh, I'll pass on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so Dennis, you might be passing on this one, on that one, but this one is specifically to you. It even starts with, Dennis, did you have a mentor or fellow artist that inspired you in your work? Uh, yeah, I had a couple of them. Uh, like I said I and I, from my public school right on up. Um, but far as my uh, high school high school teacher was Bob uh, Bert Weir, who basically, I mean, I've always, there has been a poem when I was young, uh, what is this life full of care? We have no time to stand and stare. Um, he made us sit in class and look at a brick, an old brick, I touch it, pick it up, and then draw the life of that brick, who leaned against it, whatever. But it made me more aware of everything that I touched, and there's a history in everything. And that's why I think history kind of connects. I used to love drawing old buildings because 
there was a story in it, and I imagine what, who lived in that building. Uh, just like uh, Daniel said, you know, uh, history makes you go back and put yourself into those spots. And I think that's, he made the biggest influence as far as my art. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there was Carl Owens, who was the first, uh, he was an international black artist in Detroit. He came over to Windsor and he seen my work and he made it a point as being a mentor and he would take young black artists every summer and basically bring them to his studio and work with them. So he, I did that for the one summer, but he taught me a lot about uh, being professional and that there is a, a reachable goal. And then I'll have to, before we run out of time, <laughs> Um, artist Lane, who was a, a black Canadian artist from Chatham, who is now, in, she's internationally known, lives in California, is one of the top uh, female artists. She's 90 now, still working, uh, still producing. Um, but she, I had one show with her, and when I seen her walk in as a student, she set the goal that I can make it as professional. So there's been people like that, but again, they're not known. It, so, excellent. Thank you. Here's this, here's one specifically. I also on that note, I should point out that you are saying having a mentor yes. and an inspiration is important for. Yes. for yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a quick quick one for Daniel, and I won't be able to pronounce it. But uh, the question is, how do you pronounce Wawayat Tanong again? And should we be using this word in our land acknowledgments? Uh, well, yes, you should be using it in your land acknowledgements. Um, if we, I, for example, I'm not, oh, I'm not Nish. Uh, I am Lenape. We have a different language. So in our language, uh, the closest I could find for the area is to Konehe, which is easier to say, but it's not the traditional language for here. So uh, the pronunciations I've for, for Nish can be varied. Uh, what I have found the closest phonetic, and I am no expert on this. I would probably ask somebody who is a native speaker from Manitoulin or from Walpool, but wa we ya tanang is how you would say it. Um, there's a phonetic pronunciation I can uh, try to post later on my social media or send anyone here so they can send it out, but it's a, it's a wise thing to use. And even if you get it wrong, you know what? That's all right. I mean, uh, when we first say thing as, things as kids, we get it wrong and you're learning that's the big thing that you're willing to speak it or try. So uh, as we would say, Anushik or Miigwech or Merci or thank you. So we're doing that. Great. Thank you so much. Um, here's one that I think might be possibly better if Sophie collects some answers for this. Uh, but somebody's asking if they're, they're wondering if there are any suggested or recommended reading, books, online, whatever. I think that's great, but just... I don't know if listing them off here will will help unless people's taking notes. But I wonder if that's one that Sophie would be willing to send out later if there was a couple of recommended readings from each panelist. Maybe even just one each would be great. Um, unless anybody wanted to to sorry, go ahead, Sophie. <laughs> just to jump in, maybe that's a great idea if Walter, Dennis, and, and Daniel each have maybe a couple of suggestions that we can collect by email. And I'll send them to the attendees in the follow-up email. So that way you'll have a list of um, books and authors that you can uh, go to um, and have them directly on your phone or email. So that's a great question and great suggestion. So We'll be sure to follow up with that. I don't want to mess up on the name and title of the book, but I'll give you the author, um, Edward Milo Johnson, who has written a couple of books on uh, the history of this area. And he's just, I think, he's just finishing one. But I think he has two historical books and one, uh, I think he got about four, but I know he's got two books he just completed with a lot of local history in them. So that's Edward Milo Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, this next one is, I don't know that it's a question, but I think it's still um, germane. It's more of a statement, but I'll, I'll read it out from a man who knows a little bit about history. Uh, please reflect upon the physical locations that are part of the stories. 
They can be part of the heritage recognitions where uh, people of many communities can be present. It happened right here, in other words, and that's what that person is suggesting that we, and I, I think actually you've, a few, several of you have touched on that. Any thoughts on heritage moments right there where it happened? Well, I, I also, um, Windsor's really good at destroying its history and its buildings. And uh, most queer places have been destroyed. Yeah. Um, and that's part of the sadness of it. Because um, even the, the British American Hotel, right down yeah. was a queer hangout in the 50s and 60s. And there's, I haven't been able to prove it before that, but there are references going all the way back to the 30s. Um, anything on the riverfront was a big queer hangout, and they've all of them have been destroyed. Um, mm -hmm. And JP's, uh, which some people might remember in the 80s, 90s, was actually uh, known um, as a queer area before that. And most, most of the people who went there had no idea. And then the Ritz, which was the ambassador in the 40s, there were places, all of them are gone. So then it becomes, the, it's a space than an actual uh, building. I, I take it that one of your points you're making is that let's save the buildings first and then let's recognize the historic value in them. Absolutely. A any other thoughts from other panelists on that? Yeah, I think that I, obviously this is how we can get around that political politicization of statues. I often think about Ford City. They have the, the statue of the parquet. Uh, right by the can Grand Cantina, the old, um, anyways, right in that area. It's workers working on cars. And I'm thinking in 20, 30 years, we may not know what that would look like. Mm -hmm. So the, these ideas of placing that sort of history, that's everyday history. That's not a political leader history. That's really important. I mean, I, I talked about the, the location of the, of the Odawa village on Sharon. That, that, that would be a place to put a marker. You are standing on history. Uh, such, I mean, such, think about all the mills. All the mills there used to be 15 windmills. We have one street, called Mill Street now, and uh, there was all these mills up and down. We don't know that nowadays. Now we're worried about windmills in the county shaking us into insanity, uh, which we've lived with mills for much longer than that. So these these ideas that that those are places that we could live. Excellent. Um, the last question that we have is specifically for Walter. For Walter, what's the most it's jumping around here. Sorry. Uh, for Walter, what's the most surprising queer trans history you've found in Windsor? And do you have a favorite historic story? Um, I guess the most surprising, not surprising, but surprising is I found out about a black trans woman who was murdered in Windsor in 78. Hmm. Uh, she was visiting from Toronto. Supposedly she would do this uh, a lot. And um, and just because there's been a lot of media about the black trans community and how they are a target. Um, but this was, you know, something that is close to home. And this is an, an example right here. Um, I think uh, in relation to like most exciting, like um, just being able to talk to people, people like uh, Jim Monk, Harold Damaris, Steve Lowe, these are three individuals who started the first uh, gay liberation group in 72, and they're still around, and just the amazing stories, and just being humbled by, you know, what they had to go through just daily, that it was so easy to make derogatory statements to them, to get attacked constantly, and they fought it, and they did it, and they didn't care, and, you know, Jim Monk was, was out at Chrysler's, and the and repercussions of doing that in the 70s. Uh, he, he also ran for trustee in the late 70s, you know, just doing that. He never won. We actually, to my knowledge, never had an out uh, queer uh, trustee or council, council person, to my knowledge. Um, out, that's another story. But, um, and just to know that they did these things and um, changed my life and changed future lives. I'm so humbled by that. Thank you very much. Um, Dennis, did you have one last little story you wanted to mention that you found? No, well, <laughs> I have one thing to say um, about history. Like I said, um, 
I wrote, as a child I heard the stories, but as an old man I am the story. I think we got to pass our stories down so they are recorded. That's a great idea, just even individually in families and whatnot. Yeah. And finally, Daniel, did you have a, one last little story or tidbit you wanted to share? Yeah, I'll, I'll, how long of a story do you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have, uh, you know, I, uh, go for it. I'll give you a quick one. I'll give you as quick a one as I can. We're going to deal with a little bit more prehistory, right? So let's go back to before when, uh, when these nations were founded here. And the first time we see a, a, a Frenchman coming down the river, and that is uh, La Salle and the Griffin. Okay, so at this point in time, he's rolling into, uh, rolling up while we young Tanong, and he comes to uh, the bend, uh, uh, Pointe de Montréal, which is right at Sandwich there. And he sees all these, uh, he sees all these uh, uh, indigenous folk gathered around a giant medicine rock at the base of their village. From, and they were, who they were, they were the Haudenosaunee people. Uh, they had actually pushed the three fires out during a war, and they were here hunting now. But at the base, there was a, a great medicine rock that was full of um, pictographs. It was a sacred stone, quite large. And when they, when basically the griffin waited until the, until the Haudenosaunee went into the woods, waited for the ceremonies to be done. And when they were gone, they set the party ashore and smashed the rock. They destroyed it, threw the mm. chunks into the river. Those later became millstones at Gross Point and Gross Eel. And it's from that incident that both the griffin, uh, LaSalle, and actually that North Shore of Detroit become cursed with the Nain Rouge. So if you guys don't know about the Nain Rouge, it's a de red devil that hangs out over there and uh, pretends all sorts of terrible things and shows up in fog banks and smells like nasty stuff. So if you smell mm. that, Nain coming for you. Mm. That, that and Zug Island, I think, but... <laughs> 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 anyway, I, I would like to thank our panelists very much, Walter Cassidy, uh, Dennis K. Smith, and D.A. Lockhart for not just joining us, but providing some excellent stories. I really appreciate it. And I'd like to hand it back to the capable hands of Sophie Hinch. Awesome. Thank you so much, Craig. I feel so just humbled and grateful. Um, thank you, Walter. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you, Daniel, for being here and sharing these stories. And as Dennis said, it's so important for us to record these histories. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're here talking about it, recording this so that it can be passed on and, and we can celebrate these histories and learn from them. Um, I've learned so much this evening. So thank you again for for being so open and sharing these stories with everyone here in the room. And thank you to the audience for some really great questions. Um, and this is how we keep the discussion going, right? Um, so with that said, I will launch our second poll. Um, so you should see that um, pop up on your screen in just a moment. So there we go, poll number two. After this discussion, do you feel you have a better grasp of the history of Windsor Essex? Yes, somewhat or no. Uh, question number two, after this discussion, did you learn something new or different? Yes or no. And after this discussion, will you seek out further learning about the stories told during this panel? Yes or no. So I'll just give it a few more seconds. Um, just so everyone can submit their answers and we'll share the results in just a few moments. And as I'm watching the poll, I'm also watching the chat. Um, there are so many messages of thanks to our panelists um, for being here and um, to the Art Gallery of Windsor for organizing this. Absolutely. Um, we love hosting conversations and we host host monthly conversations. So usually towards the end of the month, uh, a new topic each month, um, we really want to see what our community is talking about. Um, so with that said, I'll end the poll because I think everyone had the chance um, to submit their answers. And I'll also share the results so we can all see. So after this discussion, do you feel you have a better grasp of the history of Windsor Essex? Yes, and somewhat we can see that um, they're kind of split. So hopefully 
this will allow us to do a part two so we can keep on learning about these uh, histories here in our region. After this discussion, did you learn something new or different? Yes, 96% and no, 4%. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and after this discussion, will you seek out further learning about the stories told during this panel? Yes, 96%. So that's really great news. And no, 4%. Um, so hopefully they change their minds. We encourage everyone to uh, keep learning and keep listening and keep asking those important questions. Um, so thanks everyone for participating. And just before we uh, head out for the evening, I'll share my screen just once more. Uh, just to let you know that we want to keep this conversation going. Uh, you can visit us online at agw.ca for all of our upcoming events uh, for online resources. We have a podcast, some virtual tours, workshops, meditations, art making videos, and more. Uh, so that is all on our website. We have a really great event happening tomorrow on Zoom. We have a virtual sharing circle where the Art Gallery of Windsor, Museum Windsor, and um, Spencer Moncan, uh, who is a, a wonderful conservator, um, where we'll be sharing a little bit more about our collections and we're inviting members of the public to share their own collections. So it's kind of a virtual show and tell. So if you have an interesting collection, we're inviting you to this really cool event. So that's happening tomorrow at 6 p.m. on Zoom. Um, and the Art Gallery of Windsor is finally open. So you can come and visit us in person. We have so many great new exhibits. Uh, so we hope to see you very soon at the Art Gallery of Windsor. I'll just stop sharing my screen so I can see everyone and wish everyone a really lovely evening and extend my thanks again to Craig for being a wonderful moderator um, and for leading our discussions. Um, it was lo lovely to see you, Craig. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks Thank you again me. to Walter, to Dennis, and to Daniel. And um, I'll leave it at that. Have a great evening, everyone, and take care. Thanks a lot. Thank Excellent. you so much. Take care, everyone. Good night.